Hello guys, it's Elizabeth and today I'm going to be filming another true crime video and it is going to be a solved case today. Just a quick disclaimer before I do start getting into this case. This case, although there is a lot of information online about certain aspects of the case, other aspects of the case, it was quite hard to find information. There was not an easily accessible documentary or article that I could go to to really get a concise timeline. So I've kind of had to take information from many different sources is. So although I believe it is as accurate as possible and as detailed as possible, if I do miss anything out or if anything is a bit wrong, please just let me know in the comments and please don't take offence to that. I have tried my absolute best to get the most accurate picture of the case. But without further ado, let's just get into it. So today's case is going to be about the murder of Carol Kennedy. And this case was actually suggested to me by someone in the comments. So Carol Kennedy was a 53 year old artist, teacher and psychotherapist. And and Carol was described as just being magnetic. She was the kind of person that was just inviting, that everyone wanted to be around. And I assume that this also was a massive part in her being a teacher, just having that really good positive energy. And Carol also loved the outdoors, as did her husband, Steve DeMocker. Carol and Steve actually got married in October of 1982 in an outdoor wedding in Steve's parents' back garden that looked out onto Lake Ontario. And Carol and Steve moved around a lot in the first few years of their marriage. You know, as I said, they both loved the outdoors so they did a lot of skiing and hiking and mountain climbing and they were just such an outdoorsy couple and they eventually ended up settling down in Arizona. They also had two kids named Katie and Charlotte. So Steve became the Dean of Prescott College in Arizona and Carol actually taught psychology there. By the early 2000s Carol and Steve's children were entering their late teens and there were a lot of changes happening in Carol and Steve's life including Steve actually making a career change. He decided to change careers and ended up becoming a financial advisor. This job came with a lot more money than previous jobs he had had and he definitely lived a luxury lifestyle to go along with it. And at this same time, Carol and Steve were actually also experiencing some marital issues. Steve had had a number of affairs throughout their marriage, including one affair with a colleague while they were living in California whilst Steve was working at Patagonia and he was actually fired for this affair. I also read from a source online that Steve Steve apparently also had an affair with Carol's midwife while she was pregnant with their daughter. I'm not 100% sure that is true, but I did read that from a couple of different sources. Not only that, but Steve was also experiencing some financial issues. He had gotten himself into a lot of debt. His income was also dropping around 2007 to 2008 with the financial crisis, and he was borrowing a lot of money from his parents, you know, taking money from his retirement. As I said, he really lived a luxury lifestyle, and despite his income reducing, Steve did not want to change that lifestyle, which of course, as I said, led to him getting into a lot of debt. In the end, around 2008, after a lot of time and discussion, Steve and Carol actually decided to get a divorce. And this was finalized in May 2008, after over 25 years of marriage. Although the couple's friends and family said that they still remained good friends and even more importantly, co-parents to their two daughters, Steve was actually paying alimony payments to Carol of around six thousand dollars per month and after the divorce carol started to focus more on things that really made her happy you know her art and her teaching but she still remained close with steve and actually not long after their divorce the couple dropped off their daughter katie at the airport together as she was going on a study abroad year to south africa and katie said that her parents seemed very happy to be together when she turned back to wave goodbye to them in the airport steve had his arm around carol and despite this divorce they still loved each other very much so after the divorce, Carol was actually renting out her guest cottage to a man named Jim Nat. The guest cottage was around 50 feet away from her property and it had its own kitchen and bathroom. So it was still quite secluded from her home, but she said that he lived there quite peacefully. He didn't cause any trouble. And the two just lived alongside each other, kind of just like neighbors. On the evening of July 2nd, Carol arrived back at home after a run and she began preparing a salad, answering some emails and just getting ready for her evening alone. Carol's mother actually lived in Nashville, Tennessee. So every night Carol would call her because she was 83 years old. I think she worried about her a little bit. So it was kind of a nightly ritual for Carol to call her mother Ruth. At around 8 p.m. whilst Carol was on the phone to her mother, Ruth heard Carol shout, oh no, down the phone. And then the phone went completely dead and Ruth was unable to contact her daughter again. So because Ruth was so far away from her daughter, she actually decided to contact 
contact the sheriff's department and ask if they could send someone to check on her. She informed the sheriff's department that Carol was alone and recently divorced and she just wanted them to go and make sure that she was okay. And the police officer did actually ask her if she would be concerned about her ex-husband showing up or anything like that. And her mother said that no, she did not think that it was anything like that. So the police said that they would send somebody out to check on her, but Ruth was still quite concerned and she knew that she was there alone. But she did know that Carol did have her lodger in the guest cottage named Jim Knapp, but she did not have a contact for him. So the only person she could think to contact was Carol's ex-husband, Steve DeMocker. She thought that he would know what to do. And so she tried to contact him but she actually could not get in contact. Steve hadn't answered the phone. So at this same time Steve and Carol's daughter Charlotte and her then boyfriend at the time were waiting at Steve's house for him to arrive back home from a mountain bike that evening so that they could have dinner together. And Steve was actually running late to be back from this bike ride. It had gotten to around 9 30 and he still hadn't returned. And so of course they became slightly concerned that maybe Steve had crashed and hurt himself while out on the bike ride. And so they tried tried to call him but they again couldn't get in contact with Steve. Then at around 10 to 10 15 Steve actually managed to contact Charlotte and let her know that he had had a flat tire on his bike ride and that he had gone to the local gym to finish his workout there but that his phone had died and that's why he couldn't answer. At around 11 p.m Steve, Charlotte and her boyfriend ended up eating a rather late dinner after his bike ride and Steve of course by that point had received the messages from Carol's mother so he let Charlotte know about the strange message that Ruth had left saying that Carol had said oh no and then the phone line had gone dead and so Charlotte also tried to contact her mother but she also received no answer and so then Charlotte became quite concerned and so she tried to contact a couple of local hospitals just to see if anyone named Carol Kennedy had been admitted but she had no luck. They decided that Charlotte would go and check on her mother Carol. Steve said that he didn't want to go around and check on her because you know they had just finalized their divorce and he felt like it was a bit of an invasion of her privacy especially if you know she had been out on a date or something or she was seeing someone else he just felt like he didn't want to invade her privacy so Charlotte and her boyfriend went by to check on her so they drove around at around midnight and when they arrived they saw the police and the sheriff's department when they pulled up to Carol's home the police informed them that they had found Carol dead of course Charlotte then informed her dad of what had happened and Steve rushed over to Carol's place as well so going Going back a little bit further in the night, just before 9pm is when the sheriff's departments were dispatched to Carol's house. The investigator that actually turned up found the house dead and quiet and so he shone a light inside the property through a window and he just saw a pool of blood as well as quite a struggle and a bookcase that had been knocked over. So of course more police were dispatched and upon entering the home they found Carol Kennedy lying dead, murdered violently. The sheriff also noted that the scene looked somewhat tampered with, as if things had been moved after her death. This was including a ladder that had been placed over her body and blood splattered onto the bookshelf that had been knocked over. As well as this, police discovered some shoe prints outside the house, as well as some tracks just out the back of the house. But Carol's property actually backed onto a trail where a lot of people would go running and mountain biking. And so this was not entirely unusual, but of course they noted this. And these tracks were also unique because they were very fresh so police obviously theorized that this could have been the person that had committed the crime. Soon after police arrived on the scene Carol's lodger in the guest house Jim actually arrived and he said that he had been babysitting at his wife's house looking after his son for the evening and one of the first things Jim said was you know Carol had this crazy ex-husband Steve and that they should be looking into him. So of course when Steve arrived on the scene a couple of hours later the first thing police wanted to do was question him and so they took him down to the station and asked him a few questions. So he told investigators the same thing that he had told his daughter, you know, that he had been out on a mountain bike ride and he had received a flat tire and so he had had to go home. They did notice that Steve was covered in scratches but he said that this was from his bike ride. He'd had to go through quite a thorny trail and Steve actually admitted that he had been using a bike trail that was pretty close to Carol's house, actually within one mile of her home. 
home that night. But the police took photos of Steve's scratches and they let him go. Carol's autopsy revealed that she had died from a number of blows to the head, around seven blows to the head from a blunt object that they determined would most likely have been a golf club. The murder was extremely violent. Her skull had been completely destroyed. On the scene, there was blood absolutely everywhere. So of course, police theorized that whoever had murdered Carol must have been quite angry at her to want to inflict such violence. So detectives began investigating much deeper into Carol's life. And despite family and friends insisting that her divorce with Steve had been very amicable, they did find some emails to suggest otherwise. These emails suggested that she nor Steve were happy with the outcome of the divorce, including of course, Steve not being most happy about having to pay $6,000 a month in alimony payments. Of course, these payments were on top of the financial issues that he was facing at the time. So instantly detectives kind of looked at this as a possible motive for murder. But Steve denied this and said he would never hurt his ex-wife. The tracks that police found leading up to Carol's house on the trail behind, although police did not take impressions of these tracks, they did say that the tracks matched a bike tire that was the same as Steve's bike tire. Although it is important to keep in mind that this was supposedly a highly popular bike tire style and it was on a track where a lot of people would ride or near a track where a lot of people would ride and so it wouldn't 100% say to be Steve's but they did say it was a match for the tire that he used. Additionally to this there were the footprints that were leading up to Carol's house and police stated that this matched a type of shoe that Steve owned from a brand called La Sportiva although they determined that Steve owned this shoe through a receipt showing he'd purchased it in 2006 but they could not actually locate the shoe itself in his home. So whilst detectives were interviewing Steve on the night of Carol's murder, at the same time they had actually searched his house and garage. And one detective at the time remembered seeing a golf club head cover or sock on one of the shelves in his garage. And of course, because the autopsy had revealed the likely murder weapon was a golf club, they decided to go back and check to see if they could find that sock or a golf club or check his golf club collection because they also remembered seeing some golf clubs in the garage but when they went back they couldn't find the sock that had been on the shelf nor could they find a golf club that would have matched the sock there was a golf club missing from Steve's collection that they couldn't find and the shelf looked as if it had been rearranged as well so they considered that this could have been what Steve used to kill Carol three months after her death Steve was actually arrested for Carol's murder initially prosecutors had filed for the death penalty but after some pleading from Steve Steve's family, this was later retracted. So police stated that Steve had a motive. He had $6,000 in alimony payments to Carol every month on top of his financial struggles, as well as a $750,000 life insurance policy that Carol held that would have benefited Steve. Although police actually had no physical or forensic evidence, everything they had was completely circumstantial, including that they had found Steve had searched not long before Carol's murder how to make a murder look like a suicide and of course the fact that Steve was not able to be contacted for a couple of hours during Carol's murder. So Steve stated that that search that he had made on his computer was actually in regards to a novel that he was writing and Steve's sister actually backed this up and said that Steve had been an avid lover of writing for a long time and that she had even edited some pieces for him long before the murder. Additionally to the this, DNA was found under Carol's fingernails that didn't match Steve, nor did it match Carol's lodger, Jim Knapp. But a private investigator named Rich Robertson joined Steve's defense team and he insisted that they should investigate Carol's guest lodger, Jim Knapp, in more detail. Especially considering that he had been quick to arrive on the scene and also quick to frame Steve for this murder and say that the police should look into Steve. As I said, Jim did have an alibi and although there were a couple of people periods during the night where Jim's son had said that he was not in the same room as him. You know, Jim and his son were watching a movie that night because he was babysitting and his son got a bit bored and so decided to go and play some games in the other room. Although police could not piece together an accurate timeline for when he could have been babysitting and traveled to Carol's house. So he did have an alibi. Although they did find that Jim had somewhat of a romantic interest in Carol. He had actually referred to a lot of people that Carol was his girl 
girlfriend, although this was not the case and she did not have any romantic interest in him. This of course raised questions about whether maybe Jim had made advances on Carol and he had been rejected and so he felt he had to murder her. Although this could never be investigated further as six months later after a welfare check, police found Jim Knapp dead in his apartment that he was renting and he had a gunshot wound and it was determined to be a suicide. Although there was no note found and I did read from multiple sources that the scene was kind of weird for a suicide. The apartment looked as if it had been somewhat ransacked and apparently there were also multiple gunshots fired in the room. Again, I'm not 1000% sure of the accuracy, but I did read that from a couple of sources. Although, as I said, it was finally ruled a suicide. So after Jim's death, a divorce attorney actually received a tip suggesting that Carol's murder had been committed by someone wanting to get some kind of revenge on Jim due to his involvement in a drug ring and dealing prescription drugs. And so, of course, this was placed forward to Steve and he said that he had actually heard the same thing through someone communicating through the vents in his prison cell that someone had been seeking money from Jim Knapp for drug involvement and that their murder of Carol was retribution against Jim. Although further investigation was able to determine that this email was actually sent by Steve's daughter and Steve had instructed her to do so. He had asked her to drive 100 miles to Phoenix to send this email to the divorce attorney through an anonymous email. And so the trial against Steve begun in 2010, although there were a number of delays and issues with this trial and it actually resulted in a mistrial. So a number of the issues included this information coming out about Steve's daughter sending the email during the first trial. As well as this, Steve's defence team actually quit midway through the trial and the judge that was appointed to the trial actually collapsed in his chambers during the trial from a brain tumour. But in 2013, after a number of delays, the trial finally began and in October of 2013, Steve DeMocca was found guilty of killing Carol Kennedy and he was convicted of first degree murder, burglary, tampering with physical evidence, as well as other charges. Of course, you may be wondering about the DNA evidence that had been found under Carol's fingernails and this did come up again during the second trial and they did actually find a match for the DNA under Carol's fingernails and it was found to match 68 year old Ronald Berman. So the craziest part is Ronald Berman was actually someone that had had his autopsy the same day as Carol Kennedy on the same table only an hour and a half before hers and so the DNA under her fingernails was from contamination during the autopsy which is so crazy that you have someone here who's been murdered. It's so important to preserve evidence and they didn't even wipe down the table before they begun Carol Kennedy's autopsy. So Steve's daughters really advocated for their father, especially when it came to sentencing. Although they loved their mother deeply, they also saw their father as a loving father who took them on outdoor adventures and they just didn't see him as capable of killing their mother. And so they asked the judge to give them some hope, give Steve some hope and the possibility that they can all be together again one day, of course, suggesting that they would like to have parole for Steve after 25 years, although the judge actually rejected this request and sentenced Steve to the rest of his natural life in prison and that there was no possibility of parole. And he said that the murder had been so violent and so brutal and he could not unsee the pictures that he'd been shown during the trial, including pictures of Carol's reconstructed skull, pictures of the crime scene, which was absolutely harrowing. And he couldn't look past this. And so he decided that the maximum sentence was all he could offer. Steve's family were absolutely heartbroken by this and of course they have stood by him as well as standing by him while he makes appeals but to this day Steve does remain in jail. So of course as always I would like to share a couple of my thoughts on this case. I had not really heard about this case until it was suggested to me but it was so interesting to read about and also so interesting that they managed to convince all the jurors beyond reasonable doubt 
that Steve had killed Carol despite the complete lack of physical evidence or forensic evidence. Now, as much as I do think there are a number of things that don't make sense, for example, Steve was apparently one to never go on an outdoor adventure without making sure he had everything prepared. And so his phone dying while he was out seemed extremely not plausible. And a lot of people question that. And they said this was really unlike Steve. Not only this, but also the Google searches, they don't look good for him either. But again, Steve's sister did push the fact that Steve had been writing a novel. I don't know how true this is. They couldn't completely prove this. But overall, this is kind of the only evidence that they really have against Steve. It's all really circumstantial, the fact that they couldn't contact him for a few hours during the night of the murder. And the bike tracks, which was from a pretty popular tyre, I guess it could have been someone else. But that combined with the shoe tracks as well, apparently the shoe was a bit more rare it wasn't like a standard shoe that everyone had and so this kind of seemed a little bit more of a link for Steve to the crime scene and of course the biggest thing of all was the motive and they really believed that they had a strong motive for Steve to kill Carol as I said his financial struggles and the fact that he had to pay Carol six thousand dollars a month he was already struggling to live his lifestyle and pay his bills let alone hers as well and of course the life insurance money which apparently was also used for Steve's defense although Steve's family have advocated that they don't believe the money was a motive and that despite Steve's financial struggles he would have bounced back he made a good income and the economic crisis in 2008 of course it caused issues for him but he would have bounced back from that as a lot of other people did and they don't believe that this is a strong motive for Steve to have killed someone that everyone claims that he loved so deeply but anyway guys that is everything everything for today's case. I would love to hear your thoughts down below as well. I was so fascinated by this case. I think there's so many twists and turns throughout the case, you know, with Jim Knapp, her guest lodger, also committing suicide with no note and quite strange circumstances. And then the DNA evidence being contaminated from the autopsy, just so many twists and turns. And it was so interesting to research. So please do leave your thoughts down below or any other case suggestions that you would like me to cover. But other than that, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next one.